And we are live. Welcome, Mystery and Thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeBello, and I'm so excited to welcome back the one and only A.R. Tori, a.k.a. Alessandra, for the second time to the show. Alessandra, welcome back. Tell us about The Good Lie. Thank you so much, Sarah. The Good Lie is a psychological suspense and it's about a serial killer in Beverly Hills. That's normally all I ever have to say, and people are like, <laughs> okay, I'm in. Um, but it's about a serial killer in Beverly Hills, and he's killed six teenage boys, and his seventh victim escapes, and, um, and points the finger at a teacher at his school. But is that the real killer? A lot of people are hiding different secrets, so um, you have to read the book to figure out what's going on. Ooh, well, we are intrigued and we are here to get all of the behind the scenes juice. We're going to spill the tea, as the cool kids like to say, which is what we like to do here on the show. So first, I just want to welcome everybody. If you've been here before, you know how this works. <coughs> excuse me. And if you're new, here's how it works. Every Monday night, I give you featured authors and you get to ask them anything. Ask Alessandra about her book, her plot, why serial killers, why LA, why mysteries, anything else going on in your brain, get it going in the comments. And I will get those questions right over to Alessandra. Now I know it always takes me a moment or two to think of a question. So while you're thinking and typing and clicking away, I'll kick us off. So, Alessandra, you have written both steamy romances and chilling thrillers. What made you want to make the switch? What do you love about thrillers and why serial killers? So that's a great question. I love that question. I um, first of all, I, I never thought I would be a writer. That wasn't like a career plan. It wasn't an option. I mean, it just never crossed my mind. Um, but I was always a reader. And I was that kid, I was a bookworm. And I was that kid who read everything. Um, and I read, I read everything from sci fi to, um, to legal, but majority of the time, I, I was pretty firmly in mysteries and thrillers. That was from an early age, I was like that seven year old that had like some gory, you know, slasher book um, in my hands. The only thing I never read was romance. I never, ever, ever read a romance. One time I was stuck at a beach house somewhere and the only thing they had, like, you know, they, they had like a bookshelf. The only thing they had was Daniel Steele. And I read a Daniel Steele book. That was the only romance I read for ages until Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey was like my second romance. Um, so when I ended up sitting down to write my first book and it was kind of like I had a summer ahead of me, it was like, what am I going to do? I was in between jobs um, and I was learning about self-publishing. I was like, well, I'll try writing a book like a romance novel came out. I don't know where it came from. I broke like every rule that exists in romance. I was <laughs> I was a horrible romance author in terms of following the rules, but that's what came out. And it ended up becoming just wildly successful. And suddenly I had a book deal that was a multi book deal. So then I needed to write another romance novel and before I knew it, I was like 20 romance novels in, I still wasn't reading romance novels. Um, and in, and I'm still, was still reading um, blood and gore and, and thrillers. So um, it was always kind of like, I wanna get there, right? Like I, I wanted to switch horses, but I was already in the middle of the Kentucky Derby. Um, so I, uh, so finally I'm now, I'm now making that transition. Um, and I, a few times, like in the last 26 books, there've been times I've written a suspense novel or I've written a lot of romance with suspense. Um, but my first big jump out of romance was with the Ghost Rider, which was like, I think three years ago. Um, and that was just like a passion project. I was like, I don't care if, if I don't like a dollar off this book, like I just have to write this book. And, um, but it gave me enough success that it was a Goodreads Choice nominee for Mystery Suspense of the Year that I was like, okay, like I, I think I can, I think I can like risk it all and, and, and jump. And thankfully my, a lot of my readers have followed. A lot of my romance readers are still like, so, 
there any mystery in this or is there any romance in this book or are you going to come back and write another romance novel and but um but yeah but this is where i this is where i really feel comfortable and where i feel like my home and my future home is going to be um so i hope to write a lot more in this vein very cool. So recently, a former Cosmo editor-in-chief, Kate White, turned thriller author, uh, New York Times bestselling thriller author, Kate White, came on the show. And coming from Cosmo, we know she could write some steamy scenes, if you know what I mean. And she said she was actually very shocked when she got into the mystery world that mystery writers don't want to hear about the sex. They don't right. want sex. She said they're skimming past the sexy scenes. Now, Alessandra, we know you can steam up a page or two. Are you finding the same the same thing that mystery writers, were, they're not here for the sex or because you transitioned over from, 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 from the romance world, do your readers want to steam the pages up? Yes or no, and why? Gosh, you know, that's really tough. Um, it's, I, I've written, I, I feel like you're either in the romantic suspense genre, right? And if it's romantic suspense, then then romance is, is the key, and um, and that's where that steam belongs. But in the suspense genre, domestic suspense, psychological suspense, um, I don't think I don't think any steam belongs there. At least um, if you want to meet genre expectations, and um, and not a lot of romance. And I know for me as a um, mystery reader as a suspense reader if i start like sensing a romance subplot i get really grouchy about it like as a reader like you know i'm like oh come on like you're not gonna try like you better be killing this guy off pretty soon right or he better <laughs> end up being a serial killer or something because i really don't want a cheesy romance like in the middle of my of my uh suspense so that's how i feel as a reader um and I try to avoid the good lie has a little bit of um, it has like it does have a, a little a connection between two of the um, but uh, between two of the characters. But they very much do not trust each other. And they're definitely both hiding secrets from each other, big, huge secrets from each other. Um, and so I would not call it like someone's like, oh, but is a romance between them? And I'm like, no, not. Not really, because the entire time they both think horrible things about each other. So, wow. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Uh, I want to welcome Dana from Mystery and Thriller Mavens, my Facebook group. Everyone's invited to join. I welcome, want to welcome Jonathan. Welcome Charles. Welcome um, Paola. Welcome Jacob. Welcome, everybody. So great to have you. Let us know what questions you have for Alessandra in the comments. Get them going because she's here to answer anything. These are your questions. This is your time. Welcome, Paula. Um, I'm going to kick us off um, and, and, and ask you, uh, Alessandra, what was the hardest scene for you to write? Publishers Weekly said this kinky tale is compulsively read readable. Yum. <laughs> um, so what was the hardest scene for you to write in this compulsively readable kinky tale? Wow, that's a great question. Um, there are a lot. So just a fun fact, if you read, I'm oh, not giving away anything if you haven't read the book. Um, but if you have read the book, um, so the main character is a um, psychiatrist who only treats, um, well, who mostly treats violent individuals, right? So people who want to be a killer or they are a killer, like that's her whole practice. Um, and so that's the world she loves and knows and studies. And so she's hired when the serial killer is or the accused serial killer is arrested. She's hired to do a psychological profile on him, on the bloody heart killer and also on this um, accused killer, uh, accused potential bloody heart killer. And anyways, um, so the first uh, the first few drafts, my editor was like, we need to know more like we need to know more about the psychological profile. We need to know more about like um, the psychology behind it and whatever. So with each draft, I would add more information. And every time I would add more information, I was like, I really feel like I'm drowning the reader in this like in 
these details. And I knew I found them super interesting, but a lot of times we find things, it's a lot of times as writers, it's like we have to show off everything we know, which is that that's not a good thing, but we feel that the need to show off everything that we've researched because we put so much time in. And I was really, I was, I was ultra sensitive to that. I did not want to do that. And every draft, she'd be like, we need more. I was like, I, I, this is, this is way too much information like these readers, but I'm reading the reviews and, and it's one of their favorite things about the book is, um, is really how deep, um, Gwen, you go into Gwen's, um, mind and into the research and psychology of a killer. So, um, so it's, it's interesting. I emailed her the other day. I was like, I was wrong. Like, you're right. Like it, like we went deep enough, like, or we went where they wanted to go. But that was one of the hardest things was really, um, me, me kind of in that, um, uneasy place where I was worried that I was, I was telling too much or sharing too much, but also at the same time, balancing this very fine line of, of, keeping the reader guessing while giving them information. Um, so that was a struggle for me as a writer. Um, another, the, the biggest scene, the climax scene was one I stressed over a lot because it had to be done right. And I had so many different puzzle pieces to put together. And, um, and I was so worried that I wouldn't, you know, I've done all this build up and then, and then I have to execute it. Um, so I was really concerned about that. And I rewrote that scene four or five different ways. Um, but, uh, but, I'm, but I'm happy with how it came together. Very cool. And interesting that you should say that we, uh, that, that you were surprised to see in the reviews that the readers love this level of detail. So I'm one of those readers. I love the detail. Yum, 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 yum. It's so tasty. I love learning about whatever it is that the protagonist is, you know, doing. If she's a therapist, yeah, I want to know about the psychological profiles. I want to know, you know, what is the psychological profile of a killer? I mean, that's such a fascinating realm because I'm not a therapist and I'm not a killer. So I want to know about Thank that. Thank <laughs> or, or am I? Or are you? Yeah. I mean, that would be my alibi, right? To say it and then deny it. Tee You're clearly not going to confess to it right now on camera. <laughs> well, that would be the greatest alibi though, right? To say it and then pretend I was joking. <laughs> uh, welcome, Christina. Great to have you. Um, so that is so interesting. Um, that was the hardest for you to, for you to write. Do you have a favorite scene in the book? Um, I really love a lot of the scenes with um, the main character's best friend. She's also a, a shrink at her practice, but her best friend is a um, like a sex therapist. So they always have really fun conversation. Her best friend is like wild and just will say anything. And it was nice to have like those lighthearted moments um, in, in what was a pretty like, it's a pretty dark book. Um, so it was, I enjoyed writing those because every time it was like, okay, this is like my candy bar, you know, <laughs> after uh, after I just described this crime scene or whatever. Um, so I really enjoyed enjoyed those scenes. If I had to, it's hard for me to pick a favorite scene, but I really love the opening scene. In the opening scene, um, you see a uh, the seventh victim or the seventh um, potential victim of the Bloody Heart Killer, and he has escaped and he has... Um, coming home. I mean, he's like run miles and he's um, going up. So it's a, it's like a, it's a very wealthy Beverly Hills street. And he's going up to this big massive gate that is his house. And inside you can see his mom and she's, it's been um, six or seven weeks that her son's been missing, which typically with the bloody heart killer, he should be showing up dead any day. Um, so she's really in just this waiting game where, you know, she's waiting for news that her son's dead body has been found. And, um, and she hears his like familiar, like ring of the doorbell, like th they have custom gate codes. Um, and so she hears it and, and it really like hurts her and, because she thinks like it's one of his friends or somebody that he's given his code to. And so when she sees him, like it's, it, it was very emotional for me to write because I could just imagine like, you know, being that parent and you've, and you've lost hope and then you see, and also the son. But I also just love, I've always as a reader loved like, oh, that escaped victim and you know, what, what happened to them and what stories do they have to tell from the past six or seven weeks that they were held captive. So there was just, 
that opening scene was was one of my favorites um, because uh, there are so many different pieces. And I loved opening the book with that scene. Originally, my first draft, I did not open with that scene. I opened with a scene of um, a man killing his wife and then immediately regretting it. It was one of um, her, her clients, the psychiatrist clients, um, killing his wife, which he had fantasized about over and over again, but then immediately just like falling apart. And we ended up nixing that scene and it's now, you know, I'll have to use it as a deleted scene somewhere um, to share. Cause I, I used to love that scene, but the editor was like, eh, and I agree with it's, it was, I, I was in love with that scene, but it really didn't make sense <laughs> to share that and just start on that note with the beginning of the book. Wow. That's so cool uh, to know that the opening scene was not always that and that the one that you had envisioned was actually axed altogether, um, which is, of course, always very painful. You're like, farewell, old friend. <laughs> Go the way of the dodo bird. Like, you know, adios. Nice to have met you. I will you. see you again one day. Yeah. <laughs> Someday we'll be reunited. Um, oh, my goodness. I love it. Alessandra, what is your best advice for writers, for aspiring authors in the mystery genre? My best advice for aspiring authors in the mystery genre, um, I'd have to say, first of all, read the genre like crazy. Um, so many, I work with a lot of new authors and a lot of them are like, oh, I don't like to read. And it's like, okay, that's the first red flag. <laughs> Because and it's it was and I say that after writing uh, almost two dozen romance novels and not reading romance, um, but it's one of the things that hurt my success in that genre. Um, and not you want to write in a genre that you love and you want to read great writing in that genre so that you can know how a story should be told, what is expected in that genre, um, and then the different ways. All, a lot of times I'll be writing a scene and I'll be trying to figure out a way to say something and I'll think of another book. I'll be like, oh, you know, in book XYZ, they unfolded it like this. And that is a way that I could do it. I could use some of those same tricks of the trade. So you learn so much by, and then you have to just write, write, write. You write all of the bad words out. So. You know, if you're if you're starting to write your first book and you're like, oh, this is horrible, it might be like it might be horrible, but you have you have to get those bad words out and you have to find your voice and you can only do that by just writing and writing and writing. So and I still I'm I'm now on book 27. My first drafts are still horrible. Um, so that's just part of my normal process. I write really crappy first drafts. And then I just start slashing away and tightening them up and improving them with each each round. And now my editors know, but I think like the first time I sent my first draft, like an editor was like, oh my God, like what I don't want to deal with this author. <laughs> you know, and and then she she has now learned like, okay, like Alexander's first drafts were always crap. Like it's okay, like <laughs> how are we gonna fix this? So wait, did she tell you that, Alexandra? Was she like, this is crap, I don't want to work with you? Or did you hear that through the grapevine? Because I would be no, but now we're now we're close friends. And now <laughs> like the first so um the first draft, like she sent back a lot of a lot of edits. I mean at that point she's contractually obligated. She's stuck with me, right? But she had read my completed work. So she knew like, okay, I know this woman knows how to tell a story. Like I have no clue why that she's sending me this dumpster fire. But I know like, you know, I had proof of concept. Like I had proof that I do know how to tell a story. And so um but with like the second or third and once we got to be closer friends, she was like, now I know that when I get a book from you or a draft from you, I don't like freak out because I'm like, oh my God, you know, she's like, cause, cause I can see, she's like, you really make dramatic improvements in your rewrites. Um, and that's just my process. But if I was a brand new author and I would tell you my first book, I wrote that horrible first draft. I read it over a couple of times. I was like, yeah, it looks good. And I published it. And that was what I did back in 2012 because I didn't know any better. Um, now I have a much more critical eye so I can identify that I'm writing crap, but it's okay. Cause that's, that's my first draft. In the words of Anne Lamott, a shitty first draft. Yeah. Uh, bird by bird, in bird by bird. Excellent. Welcome, Bridget. Welcome, Keith. Welcome, Irma. Welcome, Nancy. Great to have you. Let us know if you have any questions for Alessandra, uh, a.k.a. A.R. Tori, and her brand new book, um, Out Now. Now, Alessandra, let me ask you. Let's both hold it up. 
Yeah. Um, the Good Lie. Now, why this book? Did you read something in the news about a serial killer? Did that spark your interest? I mean, how did you get hooked on this? Did you have a dream? What's the skinny? I actually, um, so this is a traditionally published books, which means that I have to sell the publisher on an idea, right? So I had to sell them on, on an idea and then we wrote up a contract and then suddenly I had to deliver on that. So I sold them on, a, on an idea that was completely different than this book. Um, and I still love that idea and I'm going to write that book someday. But um, the idea was, I don't want to say the idea because it really is quite brilliant, but the idea was Base was there was a main character and she treated violent, you know, um, violent, inclinated people. Um, and that and so that is the only thing that survived um, my first draft. But um, she was going to be treating a patient. So she was going to be treating a patient and um, and starting to get emotionally um, and physically involved with this patient, even though she knew that he was a killer. So that was basically what the story is going to be about. So then I started writing it and the book just <laughs> went in a completely different direction. And so I um, so I contacted my editor when I was about 15,000 words in, which is about, you know, 20, 20 percent in. And I contacted my publisher and I was just like, um, the story is going in a little bit of a different direction. Can I send you what I've written so far? and see what you think. And I really kind of expected to get back an email that was like, um, this is great, thank you, but let's stick to what we talked about and what we contracted for. And, um, but instead she called me, she was like, I love this. I love everything about it. Where are you gonna go with this? Where are you gonna take it? And she just jumped, you know, with me um, onto the new idea, thank goodness. And, uh, and then I just ran with it, but I really didn't know when I started writing this book, uh, the killer was going to be somewhat completely different than it ended up being. Um, and it wasn't until I was about halfway through that I really decided who the killer was going to be. Um, but initially starting out, the killer was, was going to be someone else entirely. So, uh, if the readers are guessing as they, as they read, that's okay. Cause I was guessing as I was writing. So it, it's not all deceptive, um, and red herrings. A lot of those were really where I thought the book might be going. Um, and then I kept them in. Wow. So is it fair to say you're not a plotter, you're a pantser, you go where the story oh, takes you? Yeah. Yeah. I do try to plot, but I don't, I very rarely ever stick to that plot. And I like to keep it because it's interesting to look back on later and be like, wow, like I went, I went in a different direction because you forget. Like once you're, you're in that story and you're married to it for four or five months, uh, it's hard to even remember how you got the idea to begin with, you know? Um, but yeah. Wow. So if you're if you're writing um, that way, does it ever lead you down a dark path and you're like, oh, oopsie, I don't know who the killer is or or what? Like, I mean, it's how does dangerous. That work? Yeah. Yeah, it's dangerous. There have been certain books, especially in romance and my romantic suspense, because that was earlier on when I was really trying to find figure out I'm self-taught. So I was really trying to figure out how this whole writing thing works. Um, there are times where I completely wrote myself into a corner and I had to, I mean, throw away half the book, one book, a book called tight. I wrote four different times. Like, I mean, I wrote probably 20 drafts, but I wrote four completely different entire storylines. I could have published four different books, um, that were totally different. Each one was totally different because I just couldn't figure out where I was going with it. And then I couldn't figure out which draft I liked better or which path. And it, and it, it's really a disaster. It, I never suggest to someone to be a pantser, but also that's either your mind either works one way or the other, I feel. And I'm trying to get in the middle and be a little, a little bit, you know, a planter. Um, so a pantser and a plotter or a panty liner, but, um, <laughs> which is an outliner and a pantser, but, uh, I, I definitely lean heavy to pantsing. Yeah. And the, the four totally different books in the 20 drafts led to, led to your book, which one? Type. Wait, type. Yeah, okay. Type. Wow. Oh my God. That's a lot of writing and rewriting. <laughs> That's it's a lot. It took me, it took, I could have, it took me twice as long as a normal book. Um, wow. And, I, and, um, and I, it was one of those, like, it, it, there are times where I was just like, I'm going to scrap this whole thing and just go write something else. So. 
Yes. So um, of your last book, Every Last Secret, Tyron Fisher raved. It was a glamorous and seductive novel that will suck you in and knock you sideways. Um, is that your goal to write glamorous and seductive novels or what is your goal as a writer? My goal as a writer is when someone starts on page one to never, you know, to not know what's going to happen. My biggest, or it doesn't even page one. I mean, my biggest pain point as a reader is getting, you know, halfway through and being like, oh, I figured this out. Mm. <laughs> you know, like that's what I hate. Um, so my, my number one goal is to always keep the reader guessing as long as I can without sacrificing the impact of the reveal. Um, and, I used to think, I've wavered back and forth. I used to think you have to give the reader clues, like otherwise it's yeah. not fair. Yeah. Um, and then I've gone to the side where I'm like, no, you don't have to. Now I'm back to, I want, if they read it a second time to go, oh my gosh, how did I miss this? And how did I miss mm -hmm. this? And there was that little, you know, thing. And, oh, I should have put this together. But at the same time, you don't want to spoil it for because the reader likes to try to figure it out. And if you're like me, I like getting fooled. Like even though like I I pride myself on figuring out twists and it's much easier once you become a writer because you know, you know, like there's no reason for this character to be walking into this scene. Like it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, so obviously they're the killer, you know, and then you're like, crap. But um but that that's my goal and um i just attended a writers conference it ended yesterday and um i really learned a lot there about your lane and staying in your lane and Ooh. um what that really is is referring to is 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 figuring out what you are going to be known for and when you think of the superstar mm. you think of daniel Steele or john grisham they you know what a john grisham book is right yes. it you know, um, it's a legal thriller that is told a certain way and is a certain length and does not have sex and does not have, <laughs> you know, I mean, if it has romance, it's a very, very faint thread of something, but that's a John Grisham book, you know, and, um, and you know what a Daniel Steele novel is and people do not know, or at least my readers don't know what an Alessandra Torrey novel is because for eight years, I just wrote whatever I wanted to write, you know? Mm. Um, and so Sometimes that was a sexy romance. Sometimes it was a romantic comedy. Sometimes it was a clean romance. And um, and a lot of times it was a romantic suspense. And uh, and I really hurt myself with that. And while it's fun for my creativity and it's fun for that, it hurts my readers and it has really, really hurt my growth in, in my career. So mm. now I am, I am defining that lane and I'm going to stick to it and um, and I'm not going to budge from that lane. And gl glamorous, seductive, um, I think my lane is going to be um, psychological suspenses um, that are twisted and hopefully with plot twists and keep the reader guessing, um, but that uh, that are in typically high wealth areas or, you know, kind of a glamorous lifestyle a lot of times, um, but in that domestic suspense, psychological suspense vein. And um, and I know my editors, my publishers want it to be sexy, but not sexy in, a, in terms of steam, but just um, sexy in terms of like, uh, I don't know, like fun, fast paced, um, that sort of sexy, like you see a sexy pair of shoes that catches your eye, like that sort of sexy, not sexy, like ripping off our clothes and making stuff happen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for defining that sexy yeah. for us. And we look forward to uh, you, your upcoming lane, uh, seeing you thrive in that lane. Um, I want to remind everybody that you can grab your copy of The Good Lie today from our favorite store, Murder by the Book. I'm putting the link in the comments right here. Um, so click that link and get your copy today for the sexy but not steamy <laughs> psychological thriller about the therapist treating the killer with the, uh, and the, the his seventh victim gets away, which is what we all love is that guy, the one who gets away. And how did this happen? How could it be? So you can learn more and get sucked into this fabulous world with 
A.R. Tori, a.k.a. Alessandra Tori, leading us into that glamorous world that we love so much. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my Alexa's coming on. I thought I was, I, that just scared the crap out Alexandra of me. Alessandra oftentimes triggers it. <laughs> yeah. I did not know that. It was my, it was my dramatic reading of Yeah, that's what it was, Alessandra, to, yeah. I was trying to give you some zhuzh there, Alessandra, uh, but perhaps I should stick to A.R. Tori and not yeah. trigger Alexa. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, I shouldn't have just said her name. I know. I'm going to start talking to us again. Oh, my gosh. Alessandra, it has been such a pleasure hosting you for the second time here on the show. Congratulations on another fabulous book, just racking up the praise all over the place. And we can't wait to have you back when your next book is out. Thank you. I'd love to come back anytime. I appreciate it. I always have fun with you. So thank you. Thank you so much for bringing me back. And uh, yeah, anytime. Yay. All right, everybody, grab your copy of Alessandra's book, excuse me, right there in the comments, The Good Lie. And I will see you at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central with Chandler Baker here to give us the scoop on the husbands. Have a go get a snack, go get a drink. And I'll see you back here in half an hour, everybody.